morning. God is good. And all the time. Y'all are really spread out this morning. It's so well, welcome to worship. We want to welcome those who are watching online. We do have a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, next week is uh, we have two meetings. Uh, really, um, uh, I'll go ahead and make a, an adjustment here on the fly. That, but the finance meeting will precede uh, the one board meeting. So if you're a member of the finance team, you need to be here at 5 p.m. next Sunday uh, in the fellowship hall. And then if you're a member of the rest of the board, uh, you need to show up at 6 p.m. So if you're confused about which meeting to show up, uh, you can show up for both. Um, but uh, there's a finance meeting that precedes uh, the regular uh, church board meeting. Um, also, uh, if you're a voting member of the board, we would ask that you be there because there's some, a couple items that we want to uh, get on the agenda and get uh, done. It is that time of year uh, for charge conference paperwork, which is uh, everybody's excited about charge conference paperwork, right? Nobody? It's just me. Okay. And so uh, we want to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, next Sunday, we will have the Wesley, uh, USA Wesley with us uh, here in worship as part of our worship. And uh, one of their members uh, will share about the mission of the Wesley Foundation. So it's the fifth Sunday mission project. We're going to have a special time of offering in there uh, directly after that member shares the, the, about their mission. And so we encourage you to, uh, to get ready to give uh, towards that next Sunday. Uh, of course, you can always give online or mail it to the church. And Sunday school is still in full session uh, with the two classes right now. And so uh, we also want to make you aware about the kitchen fund. I think um, uh, we have a report on that. I think the kitchen fund is, does someone have where we're at on the kitchen fund? Okay, I was going to say that, that didn't look right in there. So the kitchen fund, we're about halfway to our goal of 10000 is the goal for that new, uh, for the, the redesign and the remodeling of the kitchen. Uh, we'll find out in September about a grant that we are uh, applying for as well. So be in prayer for that, uh, for those funds. Uh, that'll help us not only finish the kitchen, but also to finish the entire project um, that we didn't even have planned for in part of that project. So you can always give. Make sure if you give to that project that you are writing on the bottom of your memo, kitchen funds. Uh, if not, it will go into the regular offering uh, as part of the financial giving. So do we have any other announcements that we need to be made aware of this morning? Going once, going twice. Sold. All right, well, let's go to prayer and get ready to worship God uh, together. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you and we come to put on the full armor of God today. So, Lord, we ask now that you would be with us. Help us. Help us to understand what it means to be armored up and to put on the armor daily. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Good morning to everybody. Let's try that again. It just, yeah, you hear that? Good morning. All right, that's better. That's it. Now let's don't sing like that. Let's sing out loud and clear. Would you stand with me as our, for our opening hymn today as we sing our call to worship? Freely, freely, we will repeat the chorus as we sing. God forgave my sin.
Doctor, and be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good to see Don and Linda back. Don had a procedure last uh, week, so good to see them back. I do have um, a one other announcement. We will be organizing a uh, worship team, and we'll be making plans. Uh, we're going to meet on September the 12th at 5 o'clock. So if you want to uh, help out on the worship team, that will be planning our holiday activities, uh, part of our worship, part of our decorations. Uh, and it's a fun committee to be on. So if you would like to uh, be on that committee, uh, please see me so we can uh, start making some plans for the upcoming holidays. They'll be here before we know it now. Uh, does anyone have any special prayer concerns this morning? We have uh, several people out sick. Uh, Diane Langley is sick. Uh, Leah Pike and uh, Roy Pike, they're uh, ill today too. Uh, we've got many that's been affected by the COVID. Uh, Jeremy Warren is still in the hospital uh, with COVID. Uh, we have one of the councilmen in uh, Creola. Uh, he's at home uh, with COVID, but his wife is in the hospital, and one of her lungs has failed, and uh, she's on a respirator with COVID. So let's all still be very mindful and take all the precautions that we can during this time. Mm -hmm. Oh, they did? Uh, Dot's uh, two older boys, Tim and Randy, have come down with the COVID. So let's just uh, remember all of them. Yes. Uh, Janie uh, did have her back surgery. Uh, and she's at home recuperating, and uh, Kathy's done a good job about lo uh, looking out for her during this time. So we'll keep praying for Janie's strength, and she can be back with us soon now. And yeah, Destin had a bad case of food uh, poisoning, and she's recovering from that. And my son-in-law, Patrick, uh, he had his uh, shoulder surgery, and he goes tomorrow to get his stitches out, and he's done very well with that, too, and I appreciate the prayers, as he does. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer again. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father. Father, we just thank you uh, so much for these last few weeks, Father, where we've been learning about the armor you provide for us to fight all the evil around us. And every day, Lord, it just seems to be more and more. And may we use your armor to resist these evil attacks and stand true to you, Lord. And Father, I thank you for each person here today and the ones listening online. We have lifted up many this morning, Father. And I just ask that you bless them and be with them and give them all strength and wisdom, Father. And may they draw closer to you. And we know that you're in every situation, in the world situations that's happening now, and all the sickness that's going around, Lord. And we do lean on you, Father, for that strength that only you can give us and the healing power that you have. And we just ask that mighty healing hand on all of these that we lifted up, all the ones that's on the prayer list this morning, Father. Lord, and just be with each of us that we may use good judgment, Lord, as, as we go about our everyday lives, that every so many years things like this happen, Father, but we can get that comfort by staying close to you, Lord. And, Father, I just thank you for the service. I ask that you bless it today, Lord, to your glory. And, Father, I thank you for that prayer that you taught us so long ago. And now if you'll join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I want to read um, from Ephesians 6, 
10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly reigns. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. with me as we sing three verses of Are Ye Able? Would you join me? You remain standing as we declare our faith in Christ together. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning, uh, we are taking up our normal tithes and offerings. And for those who are watching online, of course, you can uh, give through our church Facebook page or website. Uh, you can also uh, drop it off in person by the Fellowship Hall door, or you can mail it to P.O. Box 879, uh, and the address will be there on the screen for you. For those who are giving this morning in person, uh, you can uh, come uh, in just a moment. Uh, uh, Mr. Don and Mr. Barlow and Mr. Mike, would you come help me with the offering this morning? Unless you've already gotten three, Don. No? Okay, good. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we just ask that you would bless this time of giving. Uh, and we ask that you would bless both the gift and the giver. Help us to remember what it is to give. That we don't give begrudgingly, but we give from a place of love and according to your scripture. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you stand for the doxology? Be seated, please. Be 
This is from Isaiah 59, verse 17. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. This is God's word for God's people. Well, we have been in a series over the last couple of weeks in talking about putting on the full armor of God. And so we're going to wrap up this series because I believe that God is uh, positioning us uh, in the next couple of uh, days and weeks ahead uh, for a new series. And so next, um, our next series is going to be about how to hear God's voice, how to hear God's voice. Um, and so I challenge you to, to be here, to be a part of that. And so this morning, we're going to conclude our series with about putting on the armor of God. We've already kind of talked about it. And yes, um, you know, there's the shield of faith we've already discussed and how it extinguishes uh, not only the evil that comes at us from a distance, but it also absorbs the attack of an enemy up close and personal. Uh, the helmet of salvation and what it does and that it keeps us really from uh, taking a death blow from the enemy. In fact, the scripture that was read to us uh, in, in Ephesians says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. And so that you can stand against who? The devil's schemes. It's interesting that it doesn't say the devil's power. It doesn't even really uh, clarify. It says a scheme. And if you've ever been uh, someone who's been in the middle of a scheme, right? And if you've ever bought a car, you know what scheming is. Come on, that's funny, y'all. <laughs> you know, when they go back and forth and back and forth, and you're like, just either sell it to me or don't. But don't scheme with me, right? It says, but... Put on the, far, the armor of God so that, that you can stand against the schemes. We have an enemy who, of our souls who wants us to either A, think that he doesn't exist, right? If he can't get you to think that he doesn't exist, then if he doesn't, or even if he does exist for you, um, he really isn't all that interested in you. And the reality is, if he can do anything to make you not put on the armor each and every day, that each piece is not just about warfare, it's about protection, and so we're going to talk about these three defensive items today, about the, uh, about the belt of truth, the gospel of peace, and the breastplate of righteousness. And so I want you to be mindful because I'm going to ask you at the end, what are you clothed with? What are you clothed with? Let's pray. Lord, you've made us your holy people by your love, and you have poured out your love through us, through your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would make us able to hear by your Holy Spirit what you are saying to us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you are saying, but also enable us to be doers of the word. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Throughout this series, I have stressed to you that, uh, that, this, uh, that Paul writes that this is not about flesh and blood, that our fight or our enemy isn't with people. Uh, that God loves people, so therefore we should love people, and therefore people really aren't our enemy. Uh, and if you've ever had an enemy in life, I want to tell you this really quick. Uh, they're really not your enemy. Uh, they're, they're just, they, you might be in conflict with them, uh, but they're not really your enemy. The evil that sometimes pervades us is a slippery slope. Notice that Paul's words in Ephesians are pretty peculiar. He talks about the devil and then he also, but particularly he says on evil days, he says when evil arrives and that he also addresses evil. So there is a problem with us understanding what is evil. And that is very simply anything that is the absence of God, the absence of his goodness, the absence of his presence and his way of doing things. But Paul's importance here is that we are a new people. Ephesians addresses this over and over again, that we are not here to battle people. We're not here to label people. We're here to help people as followers of Jesus Christ. To put on the armor of God is to put on Christ. So in other words, when we pick up our scriptures and we talk to friends and family, this is not a weapon for us to use against them to get them to do what we want them to do. It is to help encourage them to see and to know God. So often Christians sometimes uh, they like uh, to, to follow a simple way and they think that that's the way to do it. 
But we as followers of Christ, we need to step our game up. Because the enemy has a scheme, and he's been doing it for thousands and thousands of years, long before you and I did. And God is giving us something, not so that we can stand against people, but so that we can stand against him, against evil. So this morning, I encourage you to go to your, uh, your passage in Ephesians chapter 6 and kind of hold your spot there. Uh, but Paul's final encouragement is for us to stand in the power of God. And as we wrap up this, I want you to be encouraged in the love of God to take up your arms against evil. Take up your arms against evil. When I joined the the Marine Corps in uh, 2004, uh, I went through boot camp. And, uh, you know, but before you ever go to boot camp, there's this guy that comes or girl that comes over to your house and they are called a recruiter. And I would like to also say that they are also just a car salesman in a military uniform. And I was 24. I didn't need to hear the whole spiel. I came from a family that served in the military. In fact, I looked the recruiter right in the eye and said, I don't need you to tell me the benefits. I already know most of them. I just need to know what do I need to do today to enlist tomorrow. But that recruiter really had to stop. He, I caught him off guard because... Um, Here's this 24-year-old guy telling him, like, don't recruit me. I'm already recruited. And, but he still went through the motions. He said, I have to do this. And so uh, I understood the benefits. In fact, as I progressed in rank, um, I moved to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, for my second tour of duty. Um, that was my second four years of being enlisted. And I was a sergeant on my way to making staff sergeant at the time. And I had this, we'll just call him Lance Corporal Jones, um, that's a generic name and title for you this morning. And Lance Cole Jones, when I arrived to Marine Corps, to, to, to Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, uh, he was as what we would call squared away. Squared away meant that um, he looked good, right? Like he had the haircut. He was, he was uh, within standards of, uh, of being what we call military weight standards. He had the nice, the high and tight, the good high and tight, high fade, uh, crisp cap, you know, on, on, on Monday mornings. His, his cover looked good. His blouse looked good. The sleeves were nice and tight. Boots looked nice and tight. You know, like everything about him screamed good Marine. And in fact, uh, he was a, a very fit athlete and uh, he was always on time and always had his stuff together. And then I remember, so I mean, I just observed him and he was willing to, to do, uh, do anything we asked him to do. There was no griping or complaining with him. We would always just say, hey, you know, hey, we know Lance Corporal Jones, he's going to do it. Like it didn't, you could ask him to, to mop a parking lot in the rain and he'd be out there mopping a, park, a parking lot. He would do whatever you asked him to do. We really thought he was this capable and an amazing leader. He was unmarried, lived in the barracks. And like I said, of all the Marines I had, he, was, he gave me no trouble. And trust me, Marines, um, we like to give trouble. And so I remember as we were getting ready to deploy, I put his name on the list because of all the Marines I wanted with me, I wanted him with me because he could do his job. He was proficient at it. He was uh, mildly, you know, um, you know, like I said, he just stayed in his lane. He did his job. But the moment that we put him on the deployment list, all of a sudden, in the previous six months, he had never been sick and never been injured. All of a sudden, this kid was at sick call every week for something new. He was injured. His back hurt. His toenails hurt. Everything, like, everything all of a sudden began to ail him. And we began to realize that, that Lance Corporal Jones was doing this thing called, um, that we in the Marine Corps call malingering, which is a fancy term for, I want to get out of whatever this is you're trying to send me to do. In fact, one week, uh, we were on a run, and I had already, uh, I was in the, the very back of the run to make sure that if anybody passed, fell behind me, it's called falling out of the run. And I'm on this run with my Marines and leading them, and we're, we're doing stuff, and, and then I see Jones try to jump and roll his ankle on purpose on the curb. Not once, but three or four different times. Like, like either A, he's got something in his eye and he can't see the curb or he's doing this on purpose. I pull him in my office and I very politely just ask him, what, what do you think you're doing? He goes, what do you mean? And I said, look, man, I've watched you for six months. You've never been sick. And the moment that we put you on this deployment, writ, the, that you suddenly, it's like you don't want to be here. And I kept him in the office for about 30 minutes until finally he kind of put his head down and confessed. I don't want to go to war. And I said, I don't know what your recruiter told you, 
I said, but this is the Marine Corps. Everybody goes. We go to war. He said, I, wanted, I came here for the benefits, Sergeant. Which I said, so did I. But I also knew that we go to war. And he really cryingly told me, and I said, now, if you're in good conscience, you need to go see the chaplain. If you really can't go, I said, but I promise you, we're going to take care of you. I promise you, no matter, you're going to go. I said, but if you don't want to go, then you need to go see the chaplain. I said, because if not, I'm going to have to send you for psychiatric evaluation, which probably would help all Marines anyway. But this moment for him is, is a reminder sometimes that we want the benefits of being something without actually participating in the fight. As Christians, sometimes I'm going to be honest with you, we like to be, how shall I say, fat and lazy uh, rather than to be in the fight. It's good. In the South, we have a phrase. I mean, if Miss Linda calls me up or says, Preacher, I want you to, uh, you know, I tell her something or she tells me, I'm going to say, praying for you. And sometimes, if we're really honest, we didn't spend one moment in prayer. That was, in fact, the word I'm praying for you was the extent of our prayer. There's so many that, uh, of us, and the, the warning that Paul gives here is also that we have become a new people, that we become a, a new person in Christ, but that we're going to experience battle that's not all about the benefits. If it's not all about the benefits, then why, uh, what, why would Paul's final words to this church be? Be strong in the Lord and put on your armor. Sometimes we have to admit that we're here just for the blessings. I mean, is anybody here not like blessings? No? Because if you don't, you, I'll take your blessings all day and twice today. It's not simply enough for us to pray for people. It's not as simply enough that we're praying for the poor, but how do we actually engage with alleviating poverty? How do we engage with helping the orphan and the widow? How are we at engaging in what God has called us to do? We not must also pray for the wicked. And we know what wickedness is and what it looks like. We must also engage with learning how to bless our enemies, not simply learning how to avoid them. We as Christians have a lot of growing up to do at times. Paul's words of encouragement here is to live as new people. Paul was making sure that the believers reorganized as new people and that who had been granted new life, a new family, and new relationships, but that they would also endure spiritual warfare. The clothing and the closing of Ephesians explains our accountability of conflict with evil forces. Each one of these items is not simply Paul uh, uh, making sure that he, they, the, the Ephesians had a good illustration. It was so that they understood how things are put together. How the body of Christ is expected to operate. That it's not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. Too many times we want comfort. Too many times that we, uh, instead of praying through it, we worry instead. Paul is admonishing them to do a new type of warfare, not to wage as they normally had. I told you a few weeks ago that I, I can observe through Facebook and through uh, our, our great social media that we always have available all around us at all given times and through our, our actual media outlets that people are very good at get, reading from the book of opinions. People are very good at swinging social economic ideas and ideologies that don't come from Scripture. People are very good at throwing those things on and showing you who they represent. But I would ask you, church, who do you represent? Who is it that you are to be clothed with? Who is it that when people encounter you, do they encounter a Democrat or a Republican? Or do they encounter someone who is in love with the Son of the living God? Someone who follows Christ. Paul's encouragement here is for them to live as new people. Many of us heard the benefits of having a relationship with God, did we not? That when we said that we, what some of us were sold on the very idea that if you accepted uh, life in Christ, that you would get what? You would get to go to where? Heaven, right? Um, Oh, that we would no longer have to be separated from God. And, and, but some of us, that's where it stopped for us. And we grew just a little enough in Christ that we don't know that we're supposed to be engaged against evil. We're supposed to be active. 
We're not supposed to be just passively going through the motions of life. It is call, a calling for us to engage against evil. We're not here just for the blessings, but to actively participate in the battle. Believers must adorn themselves with the armor of God in order to stand against the schemes. The enemy, if he can't get you to believe he doesn't exist, will he'll come and whisper to you doubt. You don't really have to listen to what that preacher says or your lay leader or your Sunday school. You can live how you want to live. It's okay for you to live that way because everybody else is living that way. And yet scripture informs us that we're called to be a holy people. And holiness doesn't come without consequences. Sometimes it means letting go of what our flesh wants to do in order to do and to obey what God wants to do in us. Paul's words here are to encourage us how to stand against these schemes of evil. The belt of truth. I mean, we know what the opposite of the truth is, right? It is to lie. The belt of truth, in fact, um, I'm just going to go ahead and be really honest with you this morning. Uh, I didn't throw on the belt of truth this morning because, uh, number one, I just didn't simply have this in my wardrobe. Come on, that was funny, y'all. Um, uh, I didn't have a breastplate of righteousness per se, uh, but the belt of truth, like you can, if you knew what ancient times, all they wore around is like they had a tunic. Uh, some people will say man dress, uh, but it's a long piece, of, basically like an old school nighty shirt. You know what I'm saying? Like is that's how it was long. It was thin. It was, it was not, it was arid so that you didn't have to worry about moisture. Um, and, but the belt of truth wasn't a fashion accessory. The belt of truth was number one, it holds the sword. There would be a sheath in there so that you could hold the sword. Because if not, you would literally be walking around like this all day, right? So it's to hold the sword, number one. The importance of the truth is that it is not a lie. In fact, John, in John's gospel, it says that if you know the truth, the truth shall what? Set you free. When we know the truth about who Jesus Christ is, it sets us free to live as children of God. The belt of truth holds things together doesn't really complete the outfit. It's not a fashion accessory. It's meant to hold things together. It's meant as an item to contrary to popular belief to hold us to resist lying, number one, and false doctrine. To resist lying and to also resist buying into false doctrine. Now, we're not going to get into what false doctrines are today. Um, some of the false doctrines that we hear today are, are mostly what I would call benign ones. You know, when somebody dies, they gain their angel wings. That, that's a whole nother branch of theology that we're not going to discuss. But there's a reality that we need to understand what is truth. And the truth is, uh, for this moment that Paul is discussing, he is discussing that the truth is Jesus Christ. That there is a cross that he went to and died for your sins so that you would be called children of God. Throughout the Ephesians, he wants you to live free, but to live free as children of God. That is the truth that Paul is expressing by the time that he gets to his finally. By the way, if a preacher ever says, oh, by the way, this is the final point, we all know it's 10 more minutes. Thanks for laughing. But the belt of truth is meant to, uh, it's the, the thing that holds us together. So, so when the enemy attacks us, we can begin in our mind's eye or in, in our inner spirit say, you know what, the truth is that God is in charge, not my emotions. God is in charge, not that lie. God is in charge of who I am. And my salvation does not come from anywhere but from God. So the moment that we begin to call it in question, because if I was the enemy and you were offered something really good, what would I do to you? I would lie to you until you believed me over the truth. So that you don't believe that you're saved. And if I can believe, make you believe that you're not saved, guess what you're not going to live like? Saved. Your confession won't be that you're saved. Your confession will always be, I'm lowly, a piece of dirt. I'm just nothing. I'm a sinner. That's it. Instead of living as someone who has been saved by the truth and the reality of Jesus Christ. So if I'm the enemy of your soul, I would attack you with lies until you believe the lie. You ever seen anybody who believes the lie? No? <laughs> 
I didn't believe in gravity until the one day I was about a five or six year old kid. I put a mattress out and jumped off my roof. I didn't fly. I fell. Luckily, there was a mattress. You know what I'm saying? But I believe the lie. And some of us, we buy into the lie because the lie sounds easier than the truth. Doesn't it? Sometimes the lie sounds easier than the truth. So there's the belt of truth. And then there's this uh, breastplate of righteousness. So the, the belt of truth is to help us to resist lying, not only to ourselves, but to resist to tell a lie, but to resist to also believe a lie and to not believe in false doctrine. The breastplate of righteousness is a, a covering, a quality of righteousness. Now, I did say that I don't own this piece. There's a reason I didn't wear that today. It was way too, I, I got way too much farmer tan going on, okay? All right. So, um, one more time for the viewers at home. Why did you laugh both times? I'm just saying. I mean, self-conscious, man, self-conscious. No. So righteousness is, uh, if you were to understand righteousness, there, there are several theological definitions of righteousness. Uh, righteousness is not, uh, not only something that we do, it's something that God is. God is a righteous God. In other words, he cannot be wrong. Now, you can be wrong because I know some of you root for Auburn. Okay, anyway, that was me getting back at you. I love you. Uh, I know some of you can be wrong because uh, the Bible says that our righteousness, now notice there's a comparison here. Our righteousness in 2 Corinthians is said, but filthy rags. Our righteousness is but filthy rags. In other words, when we try to compare our righteousness to what Christ's righteousness is, it would be like going to battle with, instead of with going to battle with that, like, imagine, like, you found a dirty washcloth, and you're like, this is it. That's all I'm wearing today. <laughs> it's a weird image, right? But that's what the image is. It's ridiculous that when we try to tell people, I'm a good person, without telling them, the only reason I'm a good person is because I serve a good God. I'm only good because God has made me good, not because I was raised right or anything else outside of Christ. <clears throat> that's why I tell people, don't raise your kid in church. They'll come out being the church uh, and about with a little C. Raise them in Christ. Raise them in Christ. Raise them to understand that God's righteousness is that he's already paid for uh, all sin for all eternity. That they don't have to earn it. Ephesians chapter 2 uh, verse 8 is one of my favorite passages of all time. It says, for by grace through faith you have been saved. That word saved is the same word as righteousness. So by that you have been made righteous. In other words, when God looks at you, he doesn't see the filthy rag because if he sees the filthy rag, he's first going to be like, ew. And then secondly, he's going to be like, I gave you something better. I gave you Christ. Quit trying to earn it. You couldn't get yourself clean enough. I gave you righteousness that comes from me, from my son. For it says that the Lord and the Son are one. To be made right with God is what righteousness is about. Are you right with God today? There's a fancy word for also righteousness called uh, justification. We, as Methodists, we believe in, in grace. Uh, grace upon grace. We believe in prevenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. In the middle of that is that justifying grace. And the word, you can say this word, for, I love saying this word, justified, right? Can you say the word for me? Say justified. And, and when we become free and forgiven by God and pardoned from all our unrighteousness, right? We become righteous, not self-righteous, but righteous in Christ and justified by Christ. Just if I'd never sinned. The breastplate of righteousness, it's interesting, protects internal organs such as your heart, your lungs, and your stomach. In other words, when we wear the righteousness of God, we protect our, our very soul. We protect the, our, our, our capability and ability to breathe in and out of the Christian life. And we also protect the very desires that God gives us. Because I want to tell you, um, my stomach has already spoken to me and it's a spoiled brat. Anybody else's stomach talk to them like that? Right? Nobody's stomach talks to them about 11.45 in the service but me. 
because I just heard my stomach, and I'm glad my microphone went on it because it was like it went from up here to down there and back to sideways. It said, feed me. So we can go longer is what you're telling me, right? Okay. <laughs> Finally. No, okay. <laughs> Finally, right? Final point. No. But the, 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 the real story here is that our stomachs at times need to be protected, and we need the righteousness of God because our appetite for things places people in things doesn't become saved the moment that we do. Meaning, the moment that I got saved, yes, God removed some desires for sin, but there were still some desires that I didn't even know about with sin that I didn't even know I wanted with sin, right? So the righteousness of God, when we allow it to and be clothed by it, we begin to rightly align our own desires to what God does. We rightly come to it. I wish I could take that picture back. Okay. The last piece of equipment is, is pretty funny, right? The gospel of peace. It's uh, footwear. Now, uh, yes, I own sandals, but none that look like that, okay? And in fact, if you have sandals like that, you should have worn them to church today, I'm just saying. But the, the, the funny thing about shoes is you don't think about them until you need them, right? Like, have you ever gotten fully dressed but forgot to put on your shoes and then walked out the door? No. Why? Um, anybody here watch all those adventure shows on, like, Discovery Channel? You know? where they get like, they go out and they pretend to, to be like in the Garden of Eden and they suddenly they ste step on a stick and they yell, ow, I'm like, because they don't have any shoes on or in a, a stitch of clothing on. Imagine now going to battle with all of the equipment, but you don't have any shoes. You don't have any shoes. Like the very first Lego you step on, you're going to start cussing in Jesus' name. You're going to be like, whoo! step on a rock, whatever. The enemy can also lay things on the ground. Sometimes they don't have to entice you. They just have to hope that you walk on it so that your attention gets taken away by that. But God, it's interesting that he uses peace. There's a comfort that happens when we put on our shoes. We can know that we're walking in peace because I don't have to worry about what I might step on or step in. Like, yeah, sure, if you step in something, you got to clean it off, but at least you're not fully engrossed in it. You know what I'm saying? Peace is an interesting word. The, the Jewish people understand peace is the word shalom. Uh, the word shalom, of course, uh, is, uh, has a deeper meaning. Peace is not the absence of conflict. If you walk around thinking peace is the absence of conflict, you're going to be highly disappointed with the world around you. Your expectations will be off. Because if you think peace is the absence of conflict, then you are going to be always unsettled in your mind and your heart and your soul. Because every time that something happens, you're going to see, I must not be in the will of God. And if I'm the enemy of your soul, I've done my job. Because now you think that, there's, that peace means nothing is supposed to happen to you ever. But that's not the reality. Peace that God gives, the shalom kind of peace that he offers to Christ, is that it's a peace that passes understanding. That meaning that no matter what the chaos is, no matter what's going on around you, you can be content. You can be assured because he's in control. To back up a moment about the breastplate of righteousness, it also means to simply keep trusting the gospel and keep trusting in Jesus' righteousness. The gospel of peace, though, is supposed to be stabilization to you. If you were to look at that, you can see that it goes well beyond the normal footwear. Our, our footwear stops pretty much, what, at ankle level? But a Roman soldier, that actually would have actually wrapped up almost up to the mid-shin. And the reason why is so that it kept their ankle from moving left and right, from rolling, so that they would remain stable, so that when they were ready and the fight came to them, uh, you know, they weren't running around shoeless, that they had something to stand in and stand on. One of my favorite songs is 374 is uh, standing on the promises of God. So many Christians don't know that they can stand in the promise of God. That to stand in the promise of God means doesn't mean that nothing will ever happen to you. But even though it does, you can have a peace that doesn't make sense to the world around you. To have peace when there should be anxiety. To have peace when there should be anger or resentment or bitterness. Peace allows the gospel to take hold in our hearts and to stabilize us and give us 
to be a stabilizing agent that will help us move closer to God and to move when he says move. If I have peace, I don't fall for slander and I don't commit it. If I have peace, I don't want to lie or go into enviness. I am content with what God has given to me. If I have peace, I don't want to commit acts of murder. If I have peace in my heart, I don't want to hurt others. Peace stabilizes us and it helps us to resist our inward selfish nature. In other words, we don't make it all about us. These last three items to clothe ourselves with are all vital. There's not one piece of the armor that should be left out. When we wake up in the morning, and I want to challenge you over these next couple of days, because the challenge in the next 30 days after this with the next series is to pray to pray together and to pray as a church, to talk about where God is taking us and so that we can lean in and listen to God's heart, what he wants for Satsuma United Methodist Church and what he wants for your life. I dare say that this is an important time and season in the life of the church. It will end and conclude with a vision Sunday. I will challenge you each and every week to pray for 30 days, to pray where is God asking us to focus the battle at in our community? If it's not against flesh and blood, where is the suffering at? Where do people need hope? And how can we love them as Christ does? But I promise you that when we start beginning to talk to God and to listen to God and, and learning to hear God's voice, I can almost assure you the moment that that happens, the enemy of your soul is going to show up. Rest assured, that's why we talked about this armor of God. So that we would know how to stand against that enemy when they come. So that we would resist false doctrine. So that we would resist doing things our way. So that we would have a shield to keep us from the enemy's attack so that we would have a weapon to fight back with, so that we would have something that would keep our minds secure and where our faith lies. Like the old poster, I'm asking you to enlist. God is looking for those who would stand for the gospel of truth. I would encourage you to join our nurture team which consists of various elements who are committed to helping families grow in Christ, whether it's the prayer team or a greeting or ushers, benevolence, youth or children's, Sunday school or small groups. I encourage you to begin praying about that. Where can I help others grow so that they can also make the stand against evil? God is not calling us to be passive just because there's a disease. He's calling us to be active, to be aware of the enemy's schemes so that we can love people like never before and shine the light of Christ in these dark times. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that you would help us to be armored up, to put it on so that we can stand against evil and the schemes of the wicked one. So that when lies come, we can be assured of the truth. When our selfishness comes, we can be assured of your righteousness in us. And Lord, that when temptation comes, we would respond according to your word. We pray this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said. For our closing hymn, would you stand with me as we sing, I need thee every hour. Would you join me?
friends, would you receive this benediction? I send you now as soldiers of the cross, <clears throat> armored up to be those who would shine the light of Christ and the love of Christ everywhere you go, to stand against the enemy's schemes. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.